All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest tonight. It's Patrick Jackson from the UK. He's author of Quantum Paranormal. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Hey, how's it going? You all right? Absolutely, man. I'm fantastic. I've been excited to talk to you. So I want to get right into it. So if you would tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background and what got you into the paranormal and on this journey that you've been on for, for quite a while now. Um, so basically, uh, my background is I'm an ICE specialist, um, predominantly in the area of reverse engineering. Um, so basically what that means is, is that I, I work on databases all day. And uh, what I do is, is that when we have problems, I have to reverse engineer processes and things like that. Um, and many of these processes are, are dependent on, you know, the company depends on them, but no one really knows how they work. So it's kind of like my, my job to figure that out and then document it. So it can then be replicated and modified. Um, and that's kind of what I've been doing professionally for, you know, quite a while. And uh, I kind of always been interested in the paranormal even growing up. I, gr I grew up in quite a, a paranormal area. Um, it was a UFO hotspot, um, lots of, you know, ghosts and stuff going on around the area. Um, I used to go around my, around my friend's house and uh, we'd be playing the PlayStation and uh, you'd hear footsteps running across the ceiling upstairs and you say, well, who's upstairs? And there's no one up there. So it, it was that blatant, you know. Um, and so it's always, it's always interested me. And I, I just kind of thought, well, what happens if, let me just give it a try and I just want to see what I can find. When I, when I kind of decided to do it, I didn't actually go in with the intention to, to write a book or anything or make a big thing of it. It was just really like something that was kept niggling me all, all my life. Um, when I was uh, younger, I, I had, I suppose, what you would call a, a close encounter with, um, with a ghost monk. And uh, it, was, it, was quite, it was quite interesting to talk about it because basically I was just sitting on a swing um, waiting for, this, uh, for the pub to open, actually. And it was like summertime. It was late evening kind of thing, about 7 o'clock. And uh, I was just sitting there minding my own business. And... I just looked across the, the field and there was this guy in a monk's outfit standing there like a statue. And I just thought it was some crazy loon from, you know, from the neighborhood kind of thing. So I was like, I just shouted at him and swore, swore at him a bit and said, you know, what are you doing kind of thing. And, uh, but I just stood there like a statue and I was like, well, that's weird. So I pulled out my laser pointer I had at the time. Um, back then they were all the rage, they just came out. And, I pulled my, my uh, red laser pointer out and I shot the laser at him and I saw it reflect off his chest and got him right in the face. And I was like, oh, yeah, get some of that, you know, because he wasn't answering me. So I thought I'd just bug him with this. And uh, But when the laser hit, it was just like a black mass. It wasn't actually reflecting anything. And it, it just, um, it looked like a statue. It looked like someone had planted a statue in the middle of the field. And, and this wasn't like a, when I mean a field, it wasn't like a field you grow crops in. It was like in the middle of a playing field. So uh, it was all very weird. So I just got up of it, got up and started walking towards it. And because, uh, you know, this is like my village where I grew up when I was born. So, I, you know, I wasn't really scared of anything, to be honest with you. So I just got up and just walked towards it going, well, what the hell are you kind of thing. And uh, as I got close to it, I got within about 10 feet of it. And it just kind of dissipated, like smoke just disappeared. It's always been sort of bugging me, like, you know, what, what was that all about? And then kind of like over time, it kept bugging me more and more and more. And so anyway, about, as it was like 2015, I decided to, um, or to step back a little bit further than that. After that, I was always watching lots of paranormal TV shows, like all the mainstream stuff. But to be honest with you, uh, none of the answers that these, these, you know, that the experts were giving all these celebrities and stuff were providing, it just wasn't making any sense to me. You know, logically, it just wasn't making any sense to me. Like you have American ghost hunters going into like a, a German castle or a French castle and they're saying, oh, we're contacting spirits from the 18th century and they speak English and all this stuff. And you're just like, well, fuck. You know, you're just listening to it going, are you serious, you know? And and uh, none of it made any sense. And uh, then I started noticing that there's always, there always a, the same behaviors occurring in all these places. So for like five years, I was just watching every single paranormal show in, you know, everywhere. Um, and I noticed that there's always the same kind of behaviors. There's always the same kind of mechanisms, always the same like EVP, 
there are replicates around the world, you know, banging on doors or things getting thrown around. It all replicates around the world. And uh, really all these, these, these uh, celebrities are doing, or the celebrity shows are doing, is going to one place and saying, oh, this is the history. And then they get a few things thrown around and then they leave it and they don't read anything else. Um, so none of it made any sense to me at all. From, coming from like a kind of a background that I've got, it just didn't make any sense. And so I just thought, well, I'll just give it a crack and just see what I can what I can spot. So back in 2015, I hired um, a place called 30 East Drive, which is um, said or voted to be the most haunted house in in in, in, in the uh, UK. Um, and some would say in Europe, and some would argue the world. You know. So I stayed there for about four or five days. And uh, I have to be honest, it was actually the longest five days of my life. It was, it was hard work, to be fair. Um, within 15 minutes of being in the building, and this was at night, I, I just said, no, who's there? Anyone there? And the, the coal shed door downstairs went <laughs> like that. And I was like, oh, shit. You know, because I, I was like, I'm here now for four days, four or five days, and I've already got this kicking off. So it was really, it was really overwhelming, like uh, what, what was going on. And so we had marbles throwing around, marbles grazing my face, whizzing past, banging on the doors, um, weird things, a lot of electrical weird issues, um, batteries dying, cameras dying. Um, we would stick things on walls, like with this professional GoPro um, adhesive tape, they would just fall off. Just fall off like completely like how is that even possible this is this is like on glass and it just falls off so it's, it's like going against physics it's, it's going doing all this weird stuff and uh, i had the whole thing filmed i mean it was all a bit chaotic but i had a, a like a camera crew with me as well and they filmed a lot of things and then basically um after i left there i felt really fucked up like really sick i was really ill um i um my, my brain actually started to um, um, swell in my head. I didn't know what it was at the time, but my, my brain was in my head was swelling and I could feel pressure in my head. And I was like, what, what is going on here? Because this is just weird, you know? So once we left there, the next day I felt rotten. Um, like my whole body felt like it was fried, literally fried, but not like, you know, like sunburn. But imagine sunburn on a like a nervous system, like on like on your on your internal um, uh, your internal like you know electronic signals. Everything just seemed, feel, felt really messed up. So all of this really kind of like confused the hell out of me um, because everyone's saying it was like a dead monk or, or dead people running around the building, but it was all completely wrong. Like all the patterns are wrong. Um, you see, in, in IT, in, in reverse engineering, what, the first thing you do is you look for patterns, you look for commonalities, you look for um, things that keep repeating, or, or um, you, you always have to find the patterns. And then once you find the patterns, there's always other patterns, and then there's more patterns, and it all relates logically. And then you can figure stuff out. Um, and that's how a lot of you know, highly complex um, programming issues are figured out just by looking at patterns. You don't have to read the code, just look at the patterns. So this is all going around my head for a long time. Like the patterns are all wrong. This is all wrong, that's all wrong. And then I realized that the, what was, what was occurring in the building was more like uh, computer-like than a living person. So what would happen is like something on a Monday would happen, like the door would bang but then nothing would happen for four or five days. And I mean, nothing would happen. It doesn't matter what you do, what you say, anything, nothing will happen. And this is why a lot of like TV shows are, are hoaxed, fake, because they, they only got one night in there, so they've got to make it as big as they can, but generally nothing happens. So then they just make stuff up and they go for, you know, and that's why it's all faked up. But, um, so you have this weird pattern where something will happen and then nothing for days, which isn't normal human behavior either. You know, you don't just bang on a door downstairs and then just go quiet for four days. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So anyway, I, I kind of had all this recorded 
and I kept on thinking about it in my head. I mean, I, I, I got obsessed with it. I was uh, waking up in the morning and the first thing that would hit my head would be this, the whole, the whole four days sort of wrapped in my head. Um, and I was just looking for patterns and logic and how, how, it could, how it could fit, you know, and I was, in my head, I was modeling all these different ideas, you know, I, um, what, what I can do, uh, like a lot of IT people can do is we can like take logic and then visualize it and then model it. And then once you, um, you can try, you can move the model around and then until something clicks, you know what I mean? And that's how we diagnose a lot of things real quick. Um, so I was doing all this and nothing would make sense. I was like coming up with all these, these ideas. And then what I found was is, is a friend of mine sent me a picture um, and I saw it and I just looked at it because um, at this point, I was actually staying back late after work, looking at all my photos and videos and stuff like that, just to see what I could find, you know. And then I finally got this picture and I looked at it and I put it through some photo editing software just to clean it up a bit. And what came out was a small silver sear. And it was literally the size of, uh, you call it like a baseball, it's like this big. And it was hovering off the floor. And then once I saw that, that was like my eureka moment because it was just like everything in my head just suddenly boom and, and compiled and like there's all these answers that are coming out of my head. So what is actually happening in these buildings is, uh, or in poltergeist activity in particular, uh, because you can't say the whole thing, but all I'm saying is for poltergeist activity in particular, is that um, I realized that these small silver spheres were the same thing as what the pilots saw during World War II, the Foo Fighters. Did you ever hear about them? I definitely have. I, I was literally saying it to myself as you were talking. You, you, you're talking about the Foo Fighters. Yeah. So what, 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 was, what were the Foo Fighters seen doing back in World War II? So back then, they were um, intercepting the, the, um, the Air Forces, the US Air Force and the British Air Force going to Germany and the German Air Force coming through Europe. And when I mean intercepting, what they were doing, they were swarming the, the, uh, the aircraft and then whizzing around them. And they were causing all sorts of disruptions and all sorts of problems, communication issues. Uh, they were even actually um, altering the, the laws of physics around the aircraft themselves. So they were doing all sorts of crazy stuff, but they never actually attacked the, the, uh, the crew, but they, they did cause a lot of problems. So I was thinking, well, hang on, you've got all them up there, and then you've got one of these down here. So what's, what's going on there? What's the relationship there? And then I kind of, it dawned on me what it really was. You see, the, there are three types of Foo Fire uh, Sears. So the first type, the type one, uh, they're quite large, um, and they operate approximately 100,000 feet up in the air. And they operate in swarms of about 50 or 60 and in clusters, in lines or clusters. And you're thinking, well, what, what, are, they, what are they doing? What's their behavior pattern? Well, they're intercepting things. So what are they intercepting? And then it dawned on me, they're actually intercepting other UFO craft. Now, the, the only way that that's possible is like, say for instance, you have this, <clears throat> you have, you have a cluster of them over one side of the country and you have another cluster on the other side of the country and there's something in the middle that comes down, right? So then what happens is that they can't communicate with each other because like our own stealth aircraft, they, they, they can't give off emissions. When they give off emissions, they become detectable. So what they do is like our own stealth, they use a microwave transmitter, which then will either, in our, in our case, it goes up to a satellite and then it goes, it gets relayed to the Pentagon or wherever it goes. These use exactly the same logic, but in reverse. They signal down to the ground. So what happens is a cluster here will signal down to the ground to the one in the buildings, which will then signal up to the other ones up here. So it's a relay system. So if it's a relay system and it's a drone, basically it's a drone these things, then it's, it, number one, it needs a network. Number two is receiving and, and giving off emissions. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what emissions is it giving off? So 
you've got people in these buildings who go, oh, I'm feeling faint and sick. And they faint and they start puking and they've got headaches and nausea. And they're saying the spirit is doing it to me, the evil spirits. It's not, it's radiation. It's, it's, it's high, it's high uh, energy emissions forward slash radiation. So what it does is it, it goes in line with the inverse uh, square law of radiation, where basically if you have a radioactive source, or basically it's doing what I call burst transmissions. So this thing isn't transmitting all the time. It's only transmitting when it needs to. And it's, it's the same thing we used in World War II. So what happens is they go dormant um, and they basically switch off, right? And then when a signal comes down, they come online and they start relaying, which means emissions. And then what happens is, is that they do their, their uh, once they do their uplink and start transmitting, is byproducts. So what it does, it will cause a diversion reaction to move people away from the source. So in the case of East Drive, the sphere itself is operating in the attic. And I know exactly where it is in the attic. It's above the third step in the attic. Because you have the steps, then you have the attic. And it's directly above the third step. And when it, when it starts relaying, it bangs a coal shed door, which is in the most shielded part of the building. So it moves people, so it bangs the door, everyone runs down there, and then it can transmit. But because I was there for so long, and I was always running around, I got the emissions, that's why I felt sick, because I got a form of radiation poisoning. So, I've got tons of questions, but I'll start with the most <laughs> obvious one that I'm sure most of the people that are listening to this are probably saying to themselves. Well, the first question would be this, where are they coming from? What, what, do you, what do you think or what do you know that these things are? Well, I don't know where they're coming from, but I know how they're deployed. Um, basically, you have like a, it looks like a big, like a UFO and it spins and then it's spews out all these little UFOs, little tiny UFOs. And, uh, you know, they deploy in the hundreds. Um, and generally you can't see them under your normal eyesight. You have to use infrared, um, but that's what it is. They just get deployed. Um, in fact, as I said, we, we've actually got two of these. We've got two that crashed. Um, but both, one was a failed deployment and the other one was a crash. Um, and we've done a material analysis on the one that crashed. And the one what uh, is still intact is still semi-active. It actually moves itself around. It will, it will roll itself around the house. Um, it gives off gamma rays. Um, we did a radiation test on it a little while ago. Uh, basically, before the before the, uh, the steel was rolled in, the gamma radi gamma radiation background radiation was eight. Rolled in, it was fifty. And this is when it was switched off. This is when this thing's broken. What I can tell just from looking at the behavior patterns of people and the effects they're getting, the radiation is going up to 1,000 counts per minute in these buildings, which means that it's pretty dangerous. It's getting to dangerous levels. Uh, that's when people start fainting, start feeling sick, stuff like that, which explains why they do diversion reactions because if it needs to go up even higher, it, it, it will basically do an action to move you away. And that is why it's so intermittent, because these things may only come online once or twice a week. And that's when they cause diversion reactions. And then they shut down again. So one of my other questions as you were talking about it was, I guess, so you, you go in and start investigating, air, I'm doing my air quotes, paranormal activity, and then yeah. you make this discovery that it's basically these alien or UFO or UAP drones. Did that completely divert your interest in the paranormal and you started down this path and you, you had already sort of figured out what it was? So I guess the, the rambling question would be, are you saying that you're, in your opinion, 
all of the paranormal activity or most of the poltergeist activity, we'll just stick to that, is caused by these things? It would appear so, yeah. Because, and I say that because the same mechanisms and processes that are occurring in that one building occur all over the world. It's the same show all over the world. Uh, the only difference is, as I say, these, these shows, they go to these different, different places and they just read up on history and they say, oh, well, someone died here, it must be them. You know, in fact, I'll give you a funny example is, is that there was one show, I won't mention the name of it, but they went to some place um, and the, they got the history wrong. The place was, was haunted and they got the history wrong. They thought someone died there, when in fact, no one had died there. And so, so what they had to do was they had to go down the road and find another place that was someone who died there. And then they said, oh, we think it's him down the road. And he just pops in here now and again. And they all looked a bit sheepish when they came in because they couldn't figure it out. But that's what it is. Um, but there's more to it. I mean, there's a lot more to it, uh, but that's basically it on an, in a nutshell. Um, and the, the actual the same objects that are in the buildings are swarming the US Navy right now. That's what, you know, all these Pentagon releases. Uh, and you, if you look closely at some of the images, you'll see like a, a, an object in the middle and then you'll see three spheres around it. And what it's doing is intercepting that, that uh, object. This, is, this answers the, the age old question, like where are all the aliens? Because they're basically kept out. They're kept out, it's that simple. Now these spheres have been seen from the ISS, been seen from the planes, um, seen all the time on the live stream um, from, from the ISS. It's, it's everywhere. They're the most common UFO seen today. Um, and they're also in buildings. It's that simple. And I know we kind of breezed over it and, and I'm, I'm feverishly writing notes as you're talking. So you said, I just want to clarify that you have two of these, one that crashed and one that one other one that you've collected what type of test have you done on these things and what have you been able to figure out based on having these things actually where you can physically touch them and examine them? So the, the, the objects in question are in the US. I'm, I'm in the UK and I couldn't fly because of COVID, but I have a scientist guy, a, a friend over there, and he has uh, analyzed one of them. And we're trying to get the second one analyzed, but uh, we're still trying to work on that. But he's done a whole technical paper on the first one. He's a um, sample, he's got hold of the metal and gone through it all, um, a whole technical research paper on it. He can talk about that, he's the expert on that, but he can go through all the elements um, that are in it. Um, that is impregnated with nanocarbon tubing, which we can't replicate. It's actually a smart metal. It's not, it's something we just can't, rep it's outside of our material, um, our material science. Um, and, you know, we, we've got two of them, and, and, uh, it's, and the other one is actually crashed 40 years ago and is being held by a private, in private hands, and he just keeps it in his shed. And he gets it out now and again, rolls it around and plays with it and puts it back again. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what it is. And that was still semi-active. That still, that still moves around on its own, uh, gives off gamma rays. It does all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, yeah, and I think it's the only two that are in the public domain. Uh, the other one, which was the Betts uh, sphere, um, I think that one got swapped out by the military a few years ago, but I'm not sure. I mean, I, I consider them, but, but as far as I'm aware, it's the only two uh, Foo Fire spheres um, that are in the public domain. Yeah, as you were talking, I, I wrote down about three minutes into what you were talking about, when you started describing these things, I wrote down Bet's sphere because that's exactly what it mm. sounded like. And that was going to be one of my following questions. Yeah. This thing was moving around on its own. It tended, it appeared that it had, it wouldn't roll off of tables and it sort of had the self-preservation almost in intelligent control, but yet it was this sphere that, there was clearly not a little tiny alien in it. It was, it was some sort of technology. Yeah. So that was going to be my question. What, had you heard of the bet sphere? And obviously you have, and what, what you thought that the correlation between the two, but you, you think they're, they're one and the same. Is that the what same I mean? thing? Yeah. 
Now, the thing is how these things operate is from what I can tell is uh, because as you say, there's not like a little alien flying the damn thing. Um, it's basically um, rule-based artificial intelligence. So what that means is it will have like a database and it'll have like a set of observations and a set of pre-coded actions. So what they do, what that means is they all like, they all have the same triggers. They all have the same, they're all looking for the same thing and they all have the same triggers. Um, and I could go a lot more into that, but this it's, it's a real, it's, it's, it's a long discussion, you know, but uh, that's why that's my new application, which I developed. Um, called the ghost code, uh, the, the phone app called the ghost code has come out. And what it can do is you, I, I found, well, the, the backstory of that is these, uh, these um, spheres have been seen making crop circles. In fact, you know, especially here in the UK. And in one of those circles, there was a code. So I managed to figure out, I found, find out what the code was. I then replicated the code and then put in my own commands. And then I put it into a phone app, which then broadcasts that via audio. Played it in 30 East drives, and guess what happens? What happens when you played it? You get interactions within seconds. And we've also taken it to the, we took it to Epping Forest as well, um, with a really good team here in London called. Um, West London Paranormal, they're a really good pair of guys and open-minded and stuff, you know. So they, they said, yeah, come along, we'll try it out. And we, we went camping in, in a place called Epping Forest, which is like a real haunted woods around here. And um, turned it on to, within, within two seconds, all the sensors lit up. And what it does is in the open, in the, in the open um, areas like woodlands and outdoors, it will just basically come and ping you it will come and have a look and then it will leave. And in fact, I've replicated the same thing in my garden. I've um, basically got video on my YouTube channel where I just set the sensors up and stick the phone in the middle and walk away and all the sensors light up in about 40 seconds. It's always around about 45 seconds. Um, but if you do it inside a house, inside a building where these things are actually, they're actually operating within, it generally uh, it triggers an interaction of some sort. Um, so yeah, I've done five videos, I think four or five videos now of these, of it actually working. Um, and it's now on Google Play, you can download it. It's coming out on, uh, it's coming out on um, Apple iPhone soon. Um, so yeah, it's, it's there. Um, it's been tested in America by a team called Outcast and they got a weird, they, they said they got weird reactions when they played it. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting. Um, I mean, that's how, that's how it works. That's how it works. Well, clearly you've, you've done this research for a while now and you, you've written the book in Quantum Paranormal. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the process and, and some of the, the research and the things that went into the book and, and obviously don't give away the, the baby with the bathwater, but tell us as much as you can about the book and that process. So... I, firstly, I took all the existing um, belief systems, all the existing, you know, all the stuff that celebrities say and um, how they explain it, and I just dismantled it all, um, just by using just logic, really, um, like EVP. The EVP is an easy one. Like um, the mainstream will say that um, the spirits will manipulate the radio to send through. Um, messages, or they, man they manipulate sound waves, or it's operating on a frequency that we can't hear, and all that stuff. And all that's complete crap. You see, if the human hearing uses um, compressed air to hear, so when when we're talking, our voice box and lips are compressing and shaping air, and then create sound waves, and that's why we can hear it. But you can't hear EVPs, even if, even if they're really loud, you can't hear them. And the reason why you can't hear them because they're using a different process. They're using electronic process. So what's happening there is um, they're actually broadcasting it either by a radio wave or it's like a microwave. And what it's doing is it's actually picking up on the recorders as crosstalk, electronic crosstalk. You know, like in the same way a guitar, a guitar amp will pick up uh, radio waves. 
or cheap ones do anyway. And it's, it's the same kind of effect, the same process. So what it's doing, the sphere itself is broadcasting a radio wave and then it's picking up as a crosstalk and then basically people are hearing that as voices. Um, and that's, it's that simple. Um, the other one, which is what they call direct voice, is where you can actually hear, hear voices. And how do you do that? Well, these uh, spheres, they use a field-based propulsion system. So that means it can commit force on objects, including air. So if you can, if you can expand the field and then resonate the field, you will then create compression on sound waves. Same way as a speaker, exactly the same thing, but instead of but using like a, like a field instead of a, a physical cone. And it does this and it creates sound waves and you, you can then hear voices for real. Um, and, but it always appears to happen in short bursts. So it, it can do it in short bursts, maybe two, three seconds, but then that's it. It seems to be quite uh, quite heavy on, on whatever, on, on the power or whatever it does, but that's, that's the mechanism of how it works. Um, you then have other ones where it's like, uh, how, how are um, objects moved or doors open or bang, stuff like that. Well, it's, again, it's the same mechanism. You have um, a field-based propulsion system, which can basically commit force on objects, like a magnet can, right? But instead of a magnet just affecting like metal stuff, metal things, it can affect anything. So what it does is point a, a beam basically at the door and just goes bang, 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 bang. It's that simple. Steve, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I just trying. All right. Okay. Um, we're we're doing video and audio, and I'll clearly edit all the audio stuff. The video is basically for my subscribers on Patreon, so they're they're used to this kind of thing. Uh, they get the unedited versions of the the show. So, based on that, what what I'll do is I've got a question for him on on for Patrick about what we were just talking about. And then after he answers that question, I'll just go back over to Patrick and Patrick's going to introduce you and we'll, we'll bring you on that way. Are you, you're on your phone? Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the phone. Okay. Well, while we're talking, if it, while we're, you're not talking, if you just mute, because I'm getting a little bit of feedback in the background. So um, when you're not on actually speaking, just mute. And then, like I said, I, once we get through this question, I'm about to ask, um, I'll have Patrick bring you on. Okay. I see you're muted. So, so my question for you now is Patrick that I'll play devil's advocate for a moment, right? There's I've, I've had experiences that I thought were paranormal experiences in quote haunted places. For example, you're talking about EVPs. I captured my personal, I, I captured it on my personal cell phone. I was in this place where my sister was experiencing what she believed was a dark entity that was causing issues with my young nephew at the time. And I walked down this dark hallway. Most of the people in the, that are listening to the show have heard this before, so I'll, I'll make it quick. But I was walking down this dark hallway, and I'm challenging the, quote, entity because nothing was really happening. And I say th the exact phrase you're scaring my nephew, you're, I'm a grown man, I'm not scared of you. And I clearly, when we played back the audio on my iPhone, I say I'm not scared of you, and I hear, you should be. Mm. It's plain as day. So I guess my question then, playing devil's advocate in situations like that, and I know a ton of stuff can be faked, and I know I didn't fake anything because I was myself and and my partner and my mom and my sister were the only ones there. So I guess my question to you is, is it possible that there is sort of this paranormal side to things and there may be these entities that that cause EVPs and even these disembodied voices? Are you can or are you convinced that this is these things that you're talking about in even in situations like that somehow and they're able to produce that type of stuff? somewhat on command yeah so what's happening there you see these uh these spheres like our own drones uh, can either be run by artificial intelligence or they run directly as in manual control and all it really is is someone on the other end saying yeah you should be so it can hear what you're saying and it just rel relates to you 
And but you got to understand something is that these these uh, spheres, they are um, they're weaponized. So the thing, I mean, that they've, they've been seen taking out rockets. They've been seen doing all sorts of things, um, blowing up um, crafts up in the sky. Human beings are, are an easy target. They really are. If they're really really hostile, they could just get they could do you, and you wouldn't even see it coming. Um, and the thing is, the reason why they, they're not actually doing anything to hurt you is a case of they're trying to convince you to move away. You see, gamma radiation has a neurological impact on, on people. You know, people who go a bit crazy after a while, after, if they've been inside these buildings for a long period, they start getting a bit funny. And that's because of new neurological impacts of radiation. Um, and ba ba basically, this radiation isn't always there. It's only when it's, when it's burst relay. So over a long period of time, you're going to get affected. Um, in fact, the neighbor of, of 30 Strive, she always has headaches, always has headaches. And I'm saying to her, well, do you get headaches when you leave? Oh, they disappear. And then she goes back in the house, all oh, got headaches again, you know. So the thing is, is that she's just getting hit by the, the, energy, the high energy emissions. Um, but yeah, that's that's what it is. If if these things were really hostile, they could take us out and wouldn't even see it coming. Um, in fact, I think that um, it's happened in the past by accident. You've heard of um, you've heard of uh, spontaneous human combustion. I have, and, and you're saying these things are possibly related to that in some yeah. way. Yeah, because if these if these objects are in buildings and they and say one misfires or it has to fire um, a high energy pulse, a uh, target or, or something for whatever reason. And there's someone in the way, they're gonna get fried. And it's instantaneous. Um, the only, I mean, Steve would be a good one to ask about this, but you know, if you have a, a high, a, enough high powered microwave blast, I mean, what do one microwaves do? Well, they heat atoms up. So if you put a, a nuclear source behind, or you know, a real high nuclear source behind the microwave, and directed at a person, they're probably just going to literally just disintegrate before you. And that's what you see in uh, spontaneous human combustion, where it looks like there's no other damage to the room or very little, but the person's just been fried. And I think that's that's why there's been so many, there's been so few cases of it. It's almost like um, there was like a, a software upgrade that went out and it went wrong and then they revoked it kind of thing, because you don't really hear of it happening these days. It just happened in the past. But it's never; it hasn't really been seen for a long, long time. Um, well, why don't we go ahead and I'm, Patrick? I'm, I'm going to let you introduce our other guest uh, and bring him on, and we'll. I've got a couple of questions for him right out of the gate, but we can start there after you go ahead and introduce him. Yeah, sure. This is uh, Steve Corbin. He's a material scientist in the U.S. Um, he's played a big part in my uh, own research and. Uh, we actually crossed paths uh, a few years ago. I contacted him after I saw um, his uh, the film he's in, uh, Patient 17, is that right? Where's Steve? Well, welcome to the show, Steve. I think he muted himself. <laughs> Are you still there, Steve? Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, we got you, man. Welcome to the show. All right, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. So I want to start with a question that I, I sort of asked Patrick earlier, and he was talking about these spheres that you guys have and that you've been able to take a look at. Why don't you just go right into for the audience what it is that you've got and what you've been able to find out about these things during your examinations? Well, I can mainly speak about the, um, the Jaime Masson sphere that um, uh, Mr. Jaime Masson, I think you know who he is, um, a journalist from uh, Mexico has been heavily into the UFO phenomenon for a long time, um, uh, bought a, um, a crash sphere uh, that crashed about 300 miles south of the U.S. border um, on the uh, east coast of Mexico, about 300 miles south of Brownsville, Texas. And um, uh, it crashed on a ranch there. And um, the landowner told uh, Mr. Masson that um, that um, uh, it 
uh, exploded and um, the blast wave took out a cow 300 meters away. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, sphere was damaged and um, it had uh, two uh, holes in each, um, each pole of the device. Um, and uh, it looked like it had been damaged by high heat at those areas, but uh, the rest of it seemed undamaged. And um, we were able to get a, a small sample off, uh, off the, the north pole of the device uh, near the damaged area. And uh, I was able to um, uh, subject it to my um, same protocol I use for examining alien implants. And um, it turned out to be a nanotechnological uh, uh, device. Um, there were uh, carbon nanotube uh, bundles, uh, probably electronics, um, embedded in the metal. And um, it had um, uh, regularly shaped voids about uh, half, a, half a millimeter across um, uh, and deliberately introduced into the metal to lower the density. So the stuff was about uh, the same density as aluminum, but it was made of titanium, at least mostly it was a titanium alloy. And it was incredibly strong. Um, it was much stronger than ordinary titanium. It was very, very difficult to cut. Uh, it is doubtful we could have even cut it if it weren't for uh, the heat damage um, near the, the edge where we, where we got it off. Um, and um, my working hypothesis was that the uh, uh, carbon nanotube bundles provided both uh, um, electronics, uh, computer power, and uh, propulsion via the uh, town, the um, the um, Blyfield Brown effect. Um, so they, they apparently operate by um, uh, anti gravity type propulsion, and which makes sense from the, the way they maneuver and, and um, execute such um, abrupt uh, high G maneuvers. Um, these things have also been filmed uh, making crop circles, and um, I think they do a number of things. They're, they're, like, they're like high tech drones, like Patrick was saying. And um, uh, I actually uh, wrote a report on the um, on the material, and um, I can uh, send you a copy of that if you'd like. Yeah, that would be great. And I, I, you weren't here when I asked Patrick the question earlier about his hypothesis or his theory on what these things are, are. and he was talking about the the communication and what what he feels like or what the theory is on these things. I guess my question again sort of devil's advocate, I guess, type of question. If we're dealing with something that is so apparently far advanced beyond our capabilities, the, the sort of communication we're talking about almost seems rudimentary to me. So do you have a, a I guess, an answer for that or a the sort of the sort of communication like saying uh saying you should be scared of us or something like that or, or or what well no i'm talking just in general like the type of communication we're talking about if these things are bouncing signals from one to another sort of back to a larger ship type of thing it seems to me that that's sort of a rudimentary way it's almost like a line of sight type of thing for them to communicate and i guess my question is what purpose does that serve the larger ship or the people or the things, the entities that are in control of these drones? It seems to me that if they've got this capability and they've got this sort of technology that they would be way farther advanced when it comes to communication, I guess. Does my question make sense? Communication. They can communicate with people um, telepathically. We have reason to believe that. And then, um... They're mainly in. Um, they're mainly uh, put out there to gather information um, from uh, you know all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. What people are thinking and just intelligence in general about what's going on on Earth. And um, um, I don't think that they just communicate line of sight. I think they can communicate um, through the Earth and uh, um, means other than line of sight. Uh, they, they, they probably operate with um, scalar electromagnetics, which is somewhat different than. The normal transverse waves that uh, are talked about in the textbooks, uh, Tesla knew about them, and um, um, that the system that everybody knows about, or most people that know about Tesla know about, that enables people to communicate um, through the Earth by ELF, uh, utilizing scalar waves, for example. So that's that's definitely not line of sight. And um, the uh, the shape of these things uh, is a perfect scalar antenna. It's a sphere, so. Um, Spherical antennas are what people use to generate scalar waves. 
I mean, I can yeah. tell you why he uses line of sight. Um, so basically, um, uh, what's happening is, is when the when the top uh, the, the type ones which are operating up in the sky, up high in the sky, when they detect an object, they have to signal each other. So it has to be line of sight. Otherwise, it gives off uh, emissions. Um, it's exactly well, the same well, way our, our own line of sight too. I don't think they're restricted to that. Is all I'm saying. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, they're not restricted to it. But I'm saying in in the in the um, idea of the actual interception, um, because the interception um, process replicates all over the world. Um, what you'll see is uh, three spheres uh, basically triangulating on a target, and the the bigger the target, the more spheres there are. Always in packs of three. Um, and what they'll do is, is that there'll be one at the top, one at the bottom, and one at the side. Um, and everyone sees it all over the world, from, from China to America, UK. Uh, it happened over London a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that, triangula that triangulation process can only occur uh, by using a, a ground relay. Because what it does is you have a, this obviously an external uh, interest or group of interest uh, sit sitting in the sky. And these, these uh, spheres can just hit them at all angles at once, exactly at the same time. So it's always in, in sync and it's not detectable. Um, mm. So that's, the, that's why they use a the ground relay because it's the only way you can communicate um, securely um, to produce that effect. Then what, <clears throat> and if you I'm actually, sorry, sorry if, you, if you actually map all the haunted houses in, in the UK, you'll find that there's a pattern and they generally operate in lines and clusters, um, which generally follow um, environmental topology, which replicates our own microwave-based communication network. Well, yeah, they, they, give off, they give off a lot of microwaves and um, also X-rays and gamma rays, like you were saying. And I just wanted to say that I think, I think you're right in that um, if you yeah. operate on, on manual control where there's just somebody controlling it at the other end um, or automatic yeah via some complex program, um, most likely via a very large computer system that we have reason to believe exists that um, all the aliens and the experiencers are plugged into, as well as these spheres. And yeah. um, Jaime Masson also came up with something interesting about the spheres and that they um, they dock with these, um, these long uh, snake-like objects that contain hundreds of spheres uh, going in and out constantly that um, these objects uh, are up at about 100,000 feet altitude where you can't even see them from the ground. And um, he um, saw these things uh, via a very large uh, uh, lens, uh, telephoto lens that he, that he bought. And um, if you want to, uh, to uh, check that out, you can uh, go on this website. I think it's still on there. I think I've got some pictures of, uh, of those uh, snake-like objects that he, that he sent me that I can send you to as well. Mm. And it should be noted that um, during World War II, what they, they encountered was loads of these uh, these spheres, but then it, then it, they would then change appearance. They would go from being a silver ball to a glowing light. And then what would happen is they'll pass through the walls of the... Ball, but it's got a plasma envelope around it that glows uh, various colors depending on their power output. Yeah, um, but they do, they do go into this different state, which allows them to basically quantum tunnel through walls or through um, the yeah. bodies of aircraft. And that is exactly, yeah, that's exactly what the um, the pilots were, were encountering. And they got so serious. They were, they were really scaring because they thought it was a Nazi weapon. The Nazis yeah, thought yeah, it was a US weapon. weapon. They, can, they can expose you to radiation. They have, uh, they have mm. electromagnetic weapons, kind of like phasers from Star Trek. And they uh, they can shoot gravity beams that can do a lot of damage, too. That's how they make yeah. the crop surface. Exactly, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, what what uh, the pilots of the World War II were encountering is exactly the same as what people are seeing in haunted buildings today. They're seeing um, basically balls of, uh, they, they call them orbs or ghost orbs or spirit orbs, something like that. And they're basically passing through walls and through out the other end. And then they can become solid again, knock something over and then go in, back into this transparent state again. And they can yeah. do it just... They can, phase out of, they can phase a little bit out of our continuum such that they can pass through solid objects. It's very interesting technology. And uh, John Hutchinson in his experiments has actually seen this effect in the laboratory and I'm sure the government has too. Uh, but the aliens have uh, perfected the technology and, uh, and uh, weaponized it, utilized it. 
Yeah, and what, and generally, as you say, like advanced technology can appear as magic or supernatural, right. which is then interpreted as spiritual. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. Like John that's Clark used to say. That's it. And that's one of my questions. I've had people on the show that have been through abduction, right? And that is, that's one of those questions that's always fascinated me is, how, well, let me start before, before we even get into any of the abduction stuff. And Steve, you mentioned something about alien implants I want to follow up on as well. But I'll, I'll just go ahead and throw this out there. And I know it may be one of those bigger sort of existential type questions to even get into. But I just want to know your opinion, because when I started down this path of going into the paranormal and the, the cryptids that I, I, I do another show, it's a Bigfoot show that I do Bigfoot encounters. And mm -hmm. when I started down this path and started talking to people about aliens and UFOs, my opinion was that these things were traveling millions and, and sometimes billions of light years are from billions and billions of light years away to visit Earth. And I've sort of switched that theory the more I've talked to people. And I, I sort of have this feeling that these things have probably always been here, or if not, they've yeah. moved here in some way. So I guess my right. question to, to both of you, Patrick and Steve, is what is your opinion on where these things are coming from? Do you think they're already here do you think they've been here? And let's start with you, Patrick, and then we'll move over to, to, to Steve and let him answer the same question. Well, I think they've been here since biblical times. Um, there's actually pictures in, in the Bible of Jesus standing there. And in the background, you've got like a, a, like a sphere chasing a, what looks to be a craft with the guy in the copy of the craft looking back at the sphere. So it looks to be like, um, it looks to have gone back that, that far. Um, yeah, I think they've been here for a very long time. But I think also that, I mean, like take Skinwalker Ranch, for instance, and I've contacted, I've spoken to the producers of, of, of that show and tried to um, help them out a little bit. Um, but what it is, is, is that the, what's going on at that place is, are these spheres. But it appears where that mountain is, where that big, like, uh, yeah, appears to be a mountain. There's something under that mountain where they could be controlled from or something's going on there that's related to it. Um, these spheres, they use a lot of um, advanced um, uh, stealth ca characteristics or stealth abilities. Like one could be 10 feet in front of you, you won't see it. Um, it can literally um, bend light around the shell and you just won't see it. Um, it will pass through solid objects, through walls. It will, it will do what, what it, hell it wants. Um, it is, it is uh, literally the ultimate uh, weapon, to be fair. Um, but that's, what, uh, that's what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch. Um, they can also use telepathy uh, to um, just make you not notice it as well. So they have, they have several mechanisms to cloak themselves, is my understanding. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's another thing, actually, I'll tell you about, is when I was doing my research in all of the paranormal stuff, people were saying, oh, there's haunted tunnels. And I'm thinking, well, why would a, a, a dead person want to hang out in a tunnel if you're dead? Why, why would you do that? Um, so I went to a, a few, and I, I went to this one that was deep in the in, in a woodland, little little, little tunnel, and uh, we we started doing tests there. And yeah, there was there was um, you know some some paranormal activity, and the, the sensors were going off on command, and all sorts was going on. So why why would a, a dead guy be hanging out in a tunnel? And the answer is, well, he wouldn't be, but these spheres would, because they're the perfect place to hide their electronic emissions. You see, the reason why they use buildings is because it hides, it, 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 uh, it, it shields their electronic emissions from being detected from above. So from, from uh, their threat level, which is around about 100,000 feet, when whatever's up there, they can't detect the system on the ground. It just blends in with background radiation. And it does that by using buildings to absorb the electronic signatures. So depending on what type of building it is, it'll operate in different areas. In, um, in modern buildings, like with a brick, uh, brick house, so to speak, it'll operate in the attic. But in crappy, like old wooden buildings, uh, like single floor um, with a basement, 
it will be in the basement. And the reason why it's in the basement is because it's the best place to hide the emissions. And incidentally, that's the, um, these, these houses that are, are like that are the most active as well. And the reason why that is, is because it's in the basement, it's producing a lot of emissions, therefore it's causing a lot of actions to get people away from it. Um, there was a, a recent documentary, um, uh, and basically they put an engineer in a, one of these houses to have a look at it. Um, they went down to the basement, he was doing his checks, and then he got organ failure. You know, he was, he was, he was only in the building for a few hours, and wow. then he got organ failure, multiple organ, organ failure. Was and it really? Now, yeah. His, his, his life is now screwed, basically. It, it's, he's now going to have problems for the rest of his life. But the, the, the TV shows go, oh, it's spirits, and they walk away from it. It's the demons. microwave they give off is pretty harmful, too, I think. You know, so what's happening is, is he went down there, the thing was emitting um, gamma radiation, all sorts of other things, and then gave him organ failure. Um, and that's why I get kind of pissed off with, with um, the the today's television because they're putting people in danger and then blaming demons and blaming all this stupid stuff. That's which is basically, yeah, that, you know, and <laughs> Jordan did this for, for fun or crazy. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, and I, I say to my friends who do ghost busting and stuff, who go to these places, I said, well, you can still go, but limit your emission, limit your time. You know, don't, don't spend a week there. Don't, you know, go for one night, fine. But be careful, you know, you don't, you don't want to, the moment you start feeling sick or uneasy or anything weird, you've got to get out because that's the emissions that are hitting you. Yeah, um, and bring a protector and a Geiger counter along for sure. And that's the last thing they think of because it, they think it's all spirits. Steve, See? I asked the same, I have the same question for you. Mm -hmm. Back to the original question, the alien question, I guess, these, these entities right. that are controlling these drones, where are they from? What do you think they've been here? Are they traveling here? What, what's your opinion on that? Well, there's a there's a number of aliens that are visiting this planet, um, and um, the main the ones that are doing this are the Greys, uh, the classic uh, uh, little guys with the uh, wraparound dark eyes. And um, they told the government that they'd been coming here for about ten thousand years. And um, both uh, their statements and EBIT reports uh, to the government that is, EBIT reports indicate that. Um, they're um, uh, an alliance of similar species, maybe like similar seven similar species, is my understanding, uh, that are within that come from within um, about 100 light years of here, and um, from several different planets. And um, uh, the ones that are that are doing this on Earth have been here for a long time and live here basically, and they have bases throughout the solar system. And um, some of the um, some of the older UFO contactees said the same thing that they were coming from within the solar system, and um, people didn't believe them at the time. They thought, "Oh, they have to come from other star systems." But well, these ones that are doing this live here, so um, maybe they rotate back and forth. I don't know, but um, the personnel that are doing this, alien personnel that are doing this, basically live in, on Earth or in the solar system, uh, various places. So you mentioned earlier, Steve, that you had had contact with people that have these implants. And yes. I've been I've been interested in that for a while. But the people that I've talked to, I've, I've had a couple of people on the show that have had abductions and maybe some that thought they were abducted. And nobody really had I had that question for them. Was it was there some sort of an implant or any physical evidence left behind? In some cases, there was, but not an implant. So what are you finding with these implants and what, what do you think these implants are? Are they just tracking devices or, or what are they doing and what are they there, using? This there are a lot more than that, but um, uh, yeah, I, I um, recognize two classes of uh, abductees. There's a type one and type two. The type one are people that have just been abducted a few times or one or a few times and had samples taken and cataloged and that's it. Type two experiencers or abductees are people that um, are actually members of the alien program that have been um, they've been trained and implanted and programmed in various ways. And um, there are people that the aliens are interested in. It's a lineage thing. They're interested in their genetics, and um, they seem to be looking for people that are that would make good soldiers that would could fight a war for them. They're, they're very interested in um, people of Germanic, Celtic, and Native American descent. Um, and um, uh, most type two, most if not all type two experiencers have implants. Not all type ones do, um, but um, the 
the implants, uh, to answer your question, are uh, they're, they're all tracking devices that can all be used to track. Um, but um, they do a lot of other things too, like the um, the brain implants that they put up your nose, like Lily Schreiber, Schreiber mentioned in this book, Communion. Um, those um, uh, hook the uh, subject to the alien hive mind to the computer system I was talking about and also enable them to um, access your sensory information to hear through your ears, see through your eyes, probably hear what you're thinking. Um, and um, the ones in the extremities, I think, are medical monitoring devices in addition to being tracking implants. Um, and they probably can measure everything from blood sugar to body movements. And um, they can also implant suggestions, uh, which are very difficult to ignore because the subject almost always thinks it's their idea. Kind of a kind of a disturbing thing. And uh, when you think about it, these uh, implants they're very small. Um, they're very small, which, yes. which means that they're not transmitting up to up somewhere high. They're transmitting somewhere locally. Which yeah, means they, tra they, tra they, they transmit to the spheres. Uh, it, uh, that yeah. are to, to uh, motherships in orbit, not too far away. But they're not they're not transmitting interstellar or anything like that for sure. No. So what, what, from what I can tell, I mean, if you look at the configuration of all these haunted houses and uh, the, the fact that they operate in generally line of sight, um, then they're creating their own wireless network, which means that these implants are talking to the, the network. Well, I've got, I feel like we could probably talk about this for six hours but, or more, but I, I want to get to the sort of the, the crux of this entire thing. And I guess we'll start with you, Patrick, and then I'll come back to you, Steve. Sure. At the end of the day, what, what are you doing now? What is the next step for you? And if, if there's anything you could share with people that are listening to this now, what would be that one or two things that you want everybody to take away from this and know about these things? And is it a, we should be worried about these things. We should be learning from these things. And I'll start with you, Patrick. Um, well, these, these objects aren't hostile to us. So it's, they're on our side. Um, they're actually doing, a, obviously, a very important job. Uh, but my advice is, is um, for all these people going to haunted houses to limit your emissions, limit your time there. Um, I know lots of people have got neurological effects, neurological problems. Um, who suffer with depression and all sorts of, you know, um, psychological issues because, of, and all they do all day, you know, they, all they do is go ghost hunting all the time. Um, so they need to reduce their um, emissions. Number two, you've got to give up on the mainstream. You've got to give up on all this um, demon devil bullshit that the mainstream is pumping out. And it's just one show after the other, this worshiping the same stuff, saying the same crap, just different faces saying it, you know. Um, I've not had one, I've not, I've not met one um, celebrity researcher who can answer any questions. They just say the same stuff to, you know, every week and blame someone else. Um, but the truth is they're putting people in, in, in uh, danger. Um, and the thing is, there is ways of um, dealing with these, uh, these fears. I mean, if they're, in, if, if they're actually operating in your house, there are ways to deal with it. I mean, all the cleansing stuff that the, the, the mainstream talks about doesn't work. It doesn't work and it never has worked. It's just, they're just seeing what they wanna see. Um, but there are ways you can actually move these things out and get rid of them. Um, there, are, there, are, uh, there are certain processes that can be followed that will allow a, you know, a house to become hab hab habitable again, you know, to, to be, to be done. I mean, I've gone as far as I can go uh, with the budget that I had. Um, but you know, you could, in order to get the real deep data, you need to spend a lot of money. You need literally defense level, um, defense level contractors to monitor yeah. signals and, and stuff like that and get them through. And that is probably what's been going on anyway, behind the scenes. Um, but you know, the, the, that's what it really is. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, sorry, uh, but your research is very important in that um, this is the first progress that civilians have made in, uh, in, in the paranormal in many, many years. Yeah, because the truth is, it's always been happening for the last 
I would say 100 years actually, is people going to this place and they, they're all getting all the same things occurring in all these different buildings. And then they, they're just giving it a different story on each one. Um, and I'll tell you how, how funny it is, is I, I went to do, I went to the, when we were doing the tunnel tests, um, we had a, a, um, a, a guy who's a psychic who came along. He said he was a psychic and stuff. And he's a very nice guy. I had nothing against him. He's a very nice guy. And he said, oh, we saw like a little girl and stuff. Which was interesting because another group of, uh, of of psychics who were there two weeks prior said the same story, and I said, and they said, oh, they they um, they did this ritual thing and they sent her to heaven and all that, and then this guy says he just saw her again, so it's like the same. It uses the same kind of front in order to um, mm. divert, cause diversionary actions to to what it's really doing, um, mm. by using the same story, if you know what I mean. Um, but the truth is, is, is that what's really going on is you see the, the type one spheres are intercepting other groups and interests, right? Which means that they, they surround the craft and most of the time the craft will just turn around and leave. But now and again, and I would say twice a week maybe, over the UK anyway, one is blown up, one is shot down and it's exploded. And these, these events have actually been caught on camera. Um, not often, but it is caught on camera. And then, so what happens? So like our own air force, when we shoot down a, a like a jet, the pilot ejects, right? So if these, if the same logic applies, so the uh, if they blow up a say a, a spaceship, the crew ejects, and where does the crew land? They land in either deep jungle, or they they land in a woodland somewhere, or well, they'll try to land in remote areas. So that then means you need a another group to go and find them to extract them out. So what happens in these haunted houses is always the same pattern. First, people start hearing, get, feeling a bit sick. Um, they start getting headaches. And then literally 15, 20 minutes later, they hear footsteps running downstairs. So what's actually happening? Well, the, the uplink is occurring when um, they're feeling sick because that's the emissions give coming off from the sphere. And then what happens is they get shot down, they land somewhere. They then send in a ground crew to go and find it. And it's just exactly the same process as what our own military uses over enemy countries. Like when the um, an aircraft gets shot over, shot down over Iraq, um, they will send in the SAS or the Special Forces in America to go and hunt them down and go and extract them out. Exactly the same thing. And that's what that is why um, people hear footsteps around these these haunted houses because it's easy to mask light. Light is easy to bend. You know, our, our toys can do it. You know, you can put these uh, toys into water like uh, transparent balls and you can't see them. It's just light refraction. So if you can, if you can control light with the gravitational field or something like it, you can walk around uh, and no one will see you. But you cannot mask weight and mass. That's, that's impossible to mask. So although no one can see you, they can, hit, they can hear you walking around. And that's exactly what happens in all these, these places. Uh, they'll hear someone stomping down the, uh, the stairs and then they'll basically go out the door. And there might be three or four of them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Apparently they cloak themselves too. A lot of the T's have reported um, things like footsteps in the attic or the, or the roof. Yeah. And they, they go out there and you can't see anything. Exactly, it's the attic. That's where, they, that's where they, they either are in the attic or the basement. And then when people do see them, they see like a, like a black mass. And all that's really doing is, is basically is, is Conversing uh, visible light into dark light, so you can't uh, you can't see it. It's just converting the wavelength of light as it reflects off of you. So basically, they it just appear as a black mass for them to, to people, um, and that's what people see. It's, it's basically advanced stealth, uh, photonic stealth. In East Drive, I got uh, I saw an image a few days ago, where if you look closely, the horizontal um, you see like a figure sitting on the stairs. And if you look closely where its legs are, the horizontal light is all wrong. It's, it's bending exactly the same point. And that's basically photonic uh, stealth. And it's not working, it's, it's not perfect. It, it looks good from say 20 feet, but up close you can see distortions and refractions and things like that. And that's exactly what's on the, what's on the video. Um, yeah, well, then you have a light bending cloaking system, it'll be hard to avoid it. Some, some kind of a distortion up close for sure. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, 
So what's what's occurring is is that the the they're shooting down um, UFOs up in the up in the uh, upper atmosphere, and then they're searching for the crews and then extracting them out. And that's it. And that's actually, actually what I think is going on with Bigfoot as well, because if you think about it, if um, if a, a crew lands in deep jungle, you need someone in to, to go in who can dominate the jungle, not just, you know, like a, a people like us, we wouldn't survive in the jungle that long. But if, uh, if you send in something that is super strong, super fast, super big, designed for the environment that it could just take on anything, that's what you send in. And with the Bigfoot thing is it, it, the spheres are directly related because people are seeing these balls of light and then uh, this guy turns up and then he disappears. And the footsteps, the foots, the, the footsteps will end in mud. So it just disappears. And the thing is, um, that is why they can't find one. That's why they, there's, there's never been one found dead. I mean, they, they say that one got run over, but the, the authorities took that one. But uh, they've never found one dead. They've never found any half-eaten animals or, or blood yeah. trees or anything like that. It just there's turns... several populations of UFOs uh, worldwide that are, um, I mean, of uh, Bigfoot uh, worldwide that are associated with UFOs, and um, the uh, they can they definitely have access to some of the alien technology, and that's why they never find them dead or. Uh, they can't oh yeah, them. I mean, they they are basically inserted and extracted out, and it's the same thing. So it de it depends on the env environmental topology and conditions. Different groups will be sent in and, and extracted. Um, it's the same thing. I, I think Bigfoot in the jungle is the same thing as the uh, the, the abominable snowman they see in in you know uh, the, the areas of the of, of uh, where is it like the snowy areas around the world, like up in the mountains and stuff. It's the same guy just sent in different in real hostile environments to do the same job. Yeah, uh, and that's it. And that's what that's why they can't find one. I remember, um, and that is also why they're getting a lot of paranormal effects when they try and find Bigfoot. I mean, I speak to the Bigfoot teams and they, they, they were mapping this uh, area where they think it's all going on and all the cameras would get, get, uh, get damaged or moved or they don't work or they, they block yeah. out or something. You're seeing all the same effects that are occurring in haunted houses in the middle of the jungle. I know there's a population in New Hampshire that are associated with UFOs. And they're said to be telepathic and able to um, cloak themselves and um, phase into objects and do, do the other, um, you know, most of the alien uh, type technologies. And I think these um, type two human experiencers the same way to um, act as uh, servants to um, do these kind of jobs for them. Yeah, it could be. I mean, as I say, um, but people always say, when is this going to come out? When, when, when is something going to happen? You know, and I think it's actually not that far away because the moment uh, Elon starts landing on Mars, it's going to come very apparent very quickly that they're not alone on Mars. And um, right. that's going to be interesting, that is. That's going to be interesting. And, and also the fact that now we're building all these space hotels that are, are going to go up there and they're coming up with all these new ideas to, to get people into to low Earth orbit. It's going to come very obvious that we're, we're not alone up there at all. Yeah, both the moon and Mars are, are inhabited uh, at, a, at, a, at least at a low population density. Yeah, and, and so all this, I think, is actually around the corner. I think it's within um, it's sort of within 10 years, I say. I agree. And the thing is also, um, the reason why these, these spheres become more and more, are now the most common UFO seen. I mean, people are seeing them everywhere. They fly a drone around, they see three or four fly by. They see them up um, over the Great Wall of China. They see them just everywhere. Um, and the reason for that is because We've been pumping out electronic emissions for what last hundred years, at least. So those emissions have gone into space and now approximately around about hundred light years. So anything within hundred light, light years of us has detected us, and then they come and have a look. So the, the further out and the more emissions we pump out, the more detectable we become, which means more will come and have a look. Which means that there's going to be more sphere deployment, which means there's going to be more uh, intercepts. Um, there, there may be um, aliens that have detected us further away than that, too, because um, whenever you emit any kind of electromagnetic wave, there's a transverse component and a, scal excuse me, and a scalar component, and the scalar component uh, can travel faster than light, depending on the circumstances. So um, 
we may have uh, alerted people to our presence further away than that. And it's interesting because I, I saw a video recently. Um, this was two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago in London. And then the video is on my web, on my site of, um, they were filming these two uh, discs and they had holes in the middle. They looked like donuts. And they were hovering just above uh, like a neighborhood. And you had the Sears, uh, the Sears uh, surrounding them. And the interesting thing is I then saw another video of this exactly the same object, so the, the donut shaped UFOs, um, basically trolling the F-22 stealth fighter. And the F-22 stealth fighter turns around to dive away from it. And it literally just scoops it like that. So you could say, well, that was a bit of a hostile move. And then basically these these uh, spheres now are saying you guys have got to get out. Fuck you, you know. And that's that's basically what appears to be going on. And as I said, these are these objects are the same things that the the the, um, the, the U.S. Navy are now talking about. It's what the, the Navy pilots have been talking about for for quite a while now. But I think the the truth is is that the um, the politicians just don't know how to don't know how to safely explain it to the public without the public going crazy. I think, I think uh, the politicians are so poor at explaining stuff that I think, um, I think they just prefer not to. But the truth is, is that it's gonna come out in the next 10 years anyway, uh, at least. So you may as well start talking about it now. Holy shit. I can't believe you started talking about Bigfoot like an hour and 15 minutes in, <laughs> but it, it, that sort of answers some of those questions that a lot of people have. I talked to a ton of people on, on the Bigfoot side of things on, on Sasquatch Odyssey. And that's one of the things I hear over and over at some of these habituation sites and some of the other things that, that people experience with the orbs and the spears and the, the UFO involvement and, and all of those things. And, I've always been sort of a flesh and blood kind of guy, you know, five days out of seven, I'm, I'm in that camp. But the more I have these conversations and the more people I talk to, the more questions I walk away with, which I think in this sort of thing is a pretty good thing. So in, in the interest of time, I want to start wrapping up. So I guess I'll start with Patrick first and just sort of to close things out. Tell us where people can find you. Where can people find the information that you put out? Talk a little bit about your book and where people can find that. And then we'll, we'll get over to Steve and, and we'll, we'll close out from there. Uh, well, we have a website called uh, quantumparanormal.co.uk. Uh, that's got my background and Steve's background. And we're expanding that soon as well. Um, we also have apps out there now, uh, which uh, I have a web developer. He, he builds all the apps. Uh, that's on uh, Google Play as uh, QP, uh, Quantum Paranormal Official Apps or Q, QP Official Apps. Um, that on there, there's a ghost code and other stuff like that. Uh, so, um, and then you have um, the Facebook group, which is Quantum Paranormal, the 21st Century Analysis. Um, that is getting really big now. Uh, we're getting we're getting a lot of noise on there now. Um, um, where else? That's uh, and, and and uh, yeah, that's about it. I'm I'm I've also done quite a bit on uh, US TV. I've been in a couple of things, um, but obviously due to COVID, that's a little difficult. So it's all done over 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 Zoom. Um, but yeah, that's that's getting bigger. Um, so yeah, it's all it's all looking up. It's just it's just been a little bit slow because of uh, you know the travel restrictions and stuff, but. It is, it is start building up and the app itself is selling well and people have given it five stars. The book has five stars. Uh, the book is on Amazon. Um, there's two versions of it. There's a paperback, which is a little bit expensive due to the way that Amazon uh, charge uh, for their prints. Uh, but the best one is the ebook, the color ebook. That's the best one. That's, uh, that's uh, $9.95. Um, and if you have uh, Amazon Unlimited, you can read it for free. Awesome. And I'll definitely link to all of that stuff. Yeah, cool. Uh, I think I'm muted, Steve. I'm trying to get him unmuted here. Hmm. I should also mention that we've, we've tried to contact a few uh, professors, uh, scholars in the, in the paranormal or parapsychology field, 
and they're all um they all sort of present themselves with lots of names and titles and all this stuff but then i just show them the analysis and the paper and stuff and they all disappear they all disappear it's like a wall of silence and it's uh it's it's kind of, you'd have thought that they would be up more for a chat wouldn't you but i think it'll affect their book sales i think it, they they you know and that's kind of like the wall we're up against um the mainstream tv shows don't really want to talk to us because if they want to keep selling the same old formats um the professors don't want to talk to us because it makes them look stupid to be fair um and I have to be honest with you, the, the, the book is the only book in the world, the only paranormal book in the world that technical specialists agree with. Every single guy who I have lit, who's read it, who's a technical engineer or technical specialist of some sort, agrees with it. And that's, that is a world first. There's no other book in the world, paranormal book in the world, which they would agree with. Um, I've, even, I've given it to computer architects, uh, designers, web programmers, um, even accountants, you know, people like that. Uh, and they all read it and go, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, so, but it, we're up against a bit of a brick wall. So, uh, you know, we, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, but we're getting there. So we're getting there. Well, yeah, I think it's a fascinating subject, man. I, I think it's very interesting. It's it's definitely th some things that I'm going to have to look closer at and certainly keep an open mind about. And that, that's what these shows are all about. That's one of the reasons that I, I wanted to have you guys on the show because mm -hmm. I, I have my opinions and I have my theories on things, but I am certainly open to having those conversations. And, and what you've pre presented here tonight for the audience is very interesting. We've obviously lost Steve, so unfortunately he won't be able to close out with us. But Patrick, I appreciate you guys coming on and sharing that. And I will link to everything. We'll have Steve send over his his paper, and I will certainly put that in the show notes as well. And I can't thank you guys enough for coming on and sharing sharing your your thoughts and your your research. And mm -hmm. it's definitely been an interesting conversation for sure, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I say, this is this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we can talk a lot more about other stuff, um, different mechanisms, how it all works. Um, yeah, I think so. Steve, are you back with us? Hello. Hey, I got you, man. Yeah, I got muted somehow. I guess. I think um, I think I hit the button to mute you. We had a lot of feedback coming out of out of your end, and I, I thought I could mute you and then unmute you from my side. So clearly, I couldn't. So I don't know why that would be, but um, it's it's pretty quiet here. <laughs> so uh, that said why don't you just sort of the the same thing I did with Patrick. I'll just edit that, and we'll get to the let you sort of close out your part of it any last any last thoughts to leave the the audience with about the research that you guys have been doing and and some of the findings and what's the next steps for you yeah the um uh i'm just going to say that the um uh it's very important to put um any kind of a field on a, a scientific basis and that the paranormal definitely was not on a scientific basis and without that uh the field has no future so this is definite uh, progress. Uh, the most progress, like Patrick said, has been, been made in a hundred years, and um, um, I think the vast majority of uh, paranormal phenomena are, are are caused by these uh, these alien spheres, and um, um, it, it all it's all connected. Bigfoot's connected to it, and uh, it's uh, it's so it's so different than what we're taught that it's no wonder a lot of people don't believe in this stuff. Um, it was difficult for me to believe at first that uh, Bigfoot are actually associated with UFOs, but it does seem to be the case. The more people I talk to, the more reports I get. Um, and um, for me, the next step is to um, uh, analyze more material from the spears. Um, I'd like to get more material from um, uh, Jaime Masson's spear, maybe um, from a part of the spear that's a little bit less damaged by heat, do some more tests on it. Um, and um, um, Maybe some electrical tests, find out uh, the electrical properties of these uh, carbon nanotube bundles, prove they are electronics, for example. And I'd like to get a sample of the um, spear from Texas that I think that uh, Patrick's told you about. I wasn't able to make it down there. Um, I haven't been able to make it down there yet because of uh, some uh, uh, 
family issues I've been dealing with, but um, and it's hard to travel anyway because of the pandemic. But uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to do that and um, find out what it's made of and um, 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 see uh, what similarities and differences there are for, between that and the, the Heine Masson sphere. And um, um, just keep continuing to uh, get reports from people about the sphere activity and behavior. But the thing is, I think overall is that more we learn from these things, the more we, you can, we can help people because sure. there's a lot of people in the US who, who are forced to live in these buildings and who suffer the consequence of the byproducts. And uh, as a result, you know, it causes all sorts of problems, uh, family breakups and, and whatnot. Yeah, I think, I think staking out more haunted areas and proving that there's radiation present in all cases, I think that would go a long way towards proving this, uh, proving the, uh, uh, the theories that we're coming out with too. Yeah, and obviously it, it, I think a lot of people are affected for life over, over what they think is, is, uh, is ghosts or demons or devils when in fact, with our, with, with our kind of uh, thought process, it makes people feel sane again, yeah. you know. And, yeah, so it's not only, it's not only the, the gamma radiation too, it's the, the, the scalar microwaves, like I was saying, that these things give off uh, uh, can be extremely harmful. They can cause cancer and um, uh, multiple other health problems. Yeah, is it, which is exactly what I've been seeing across the country where, where these things are, are operating from. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there could be ways that we can actually um, help families um, at least reduce reduce these effects because you can't actually move them you can't move them out um well you can but it's, it's difficult but but you can shield the family from them and if you can if you can if you can uh, shield the family then activity slows down or, or stops or reduces because as long as they're shielded the uh the spheres will not perform actions to to cause diversions to move people around mm -hmm. if you understand yeah yeah that's where we are so. it's been fascinating guys patrick steve i can't thank you guys enough for coming on the show i'll definitely have to have you back for a round two for sure i really appreciate hey. your time sounds good sounds good sounds been great to be here <laughs> awesome guys that was great um so Steve, like I said, I, I don't know if you could hear me when, when I had you muted, but I, I'd love for you, whatever you've got that you can share that you want to send over, I'll put this episode together. It probably, it may be a couple of weeks before I get it out. I've got a couple of shows ahead of this one that I'll, I'll do first. And it takes me a little while to, to edit all of it. Obviously we, we were getting a lot of feedback from, from your phone for whatever reason, Steve. So I'll, I'll edit oh. that stuff out. I'm a, I'm a pretty good editor. I'm I'm sort of anal when it comes to that. As must far be, as sound must be quality. Fear activity here. <laughs> I know. I, it's so funny. Every time I do one of these interviews, there always seems to be some sort of a, a technical sort of glitch, if you will. So every time I have a, a UFO guest on, it always happens. So well, I'm only half kidding. The, the house I'm in um, uh, is haunted. Um, we've got paranormal activity here quite a bit. Yeah, that's crazy. But I will definitely link to everything that that I know you sent a ton of stuff over to Danny Patrick. So we'll we'll link to all that stuff, the book, of course. And um, if, like I said, anything, Steve, that you have your your paper that you published, anything like that that you want to send over any photo evidence, any videos, whatever it is that you you'd like to to put out there. I'll definitely. Yeah, send it out. yeah I'll definitely and, do that. Just send me your email address and I'll, I'll send it on over. Yeah, I certainly will. Um, and this will probably air. I do two shows. I do the Sasquatch Odyssey show and the Paranormal Odyssey show. It'll probably I, I cross pro, post sometimes since we touched on the Bigfoot thing. I'll probably post it over there as well. So you'll get the, the listenership is different. So you'll basically get two audiences for one with the two shows. So um, the show's heard in about 50, 55 countries, sometimes 60. It just depends on the week. So oh, awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, what, what's a, the um, general view count? Yeah. Um, it depends on the episode, but I have probably 20 to 25,000 just active people uh, dipping in and out in regular basis, 20 to 25,000 um, folks downloading each show each week. I put That's out a show every Friday and I do the paranormal show on Sunday. So the listenership's about the same for both. Cool. That's right. Those are probably the more hardcore people that are into this stuff too. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. 
Well, that's awesome, guys. Let's stay in touch. And I definitely would like to have you back. I think there's plenty more we could talk about. So we'll we'll see how well the, oh, yeah. uh, the first show. Hours of material, I think. Yeah, I think we could probably go. I, I'd like to do like just an, an hour or so just on the, the whole Bigfoot connection with UFOs and in these spheres. I think that would be an awesome show. I can I can bring on um, Ryan. You know Ryan. Uh, he was on Bigfoot uh, ex Expedition. I think Phyllis. It has these uh, uh, creatures in her backyard, pretty much. Yeah, I know Phyllis mentioned Ryan to me. I'm not familiar with him, um, but I definitely love to have him on the show. That'd be awesome. Yeah, he was on Travel Channel. I think it was. He's done. He's done quite a lot. Um, and he actually, he actually does my tests for me in, in the deep in, in the woods as well. So he tries out my stuff. So he's a good guy to have on. Um, and yeah, he, we should he, definitely do that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. All right, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give him a bell um, and let him know. Yeah, I'm, I'm. My schedule. I think I'm booked completely through December, but I'd love to maybe after the first of the year have you guys back on and we'll we'll do a whole bigfoot show that'd be awesome yeah yeah, cool. yeah, so awesome. Awesome. yeah. all right yeah. guys well i'm gonna get out of here i've got some editing for tomorrow's show to do so i'm gonna let you guys go and it's been an honor and a pleasure i appreciate you guys coming on we'll stay in touch yeah. for sure same there sounds good no awesome. worries cool you guys have a good night thanks bye yeah.